Welcome to the chapel of the University of King's College, uh, a place very familiar to Father Robert Krauss, who we remember especially this evening, a place where he often preached, where, as we were reminded some of us earlier this afternoon, he regularly celebrated the Holy Communion on Monday afternoons, um, a place beloved to many in part because they heard him and were present with him um, for so many years here, as well as in the classroom. This series of memorial lectures was founded by my predecessor as chaplain, Father Gary Thorne, um, in 2016. Since that time, the lectures have included some of Father Krause's distinguished students, including Paige Oxchild, whom we, some of us heard earlier this afternoon, Walter Hannum, Roberta Barker, um, and a, a number of others, including uh, Father Andrew Louth, um, internationally renowned Orthodox uh, scholar. And so the, the uh, the series continues with um, other current, Tom Curran, and I'm as tempted as I am to say something, I'm not going to. I'm going to invite our Vice President, Sarah Clift, to come up and say a few words to introduce Father Tom Curran. Then comes Tom's scholarly preoccupation with Dante's Divine Comedy and its endless references, references to references, <laughs> what we scholars call its intertextuality. Again, there's that hall of mirrors. Anyone who knows him can appreciate how much inspiration tonight's speaker draws from the ways in which epochs speak to each other. Moments, texts, motifs, structures, emblems are constantly re-emerging in new ways, confounding our categories of old and new, ancient and modern, mundane and divine. 
I venture to say that it is this doubled resonance, or a flatter term, perspective, a game one both serious and playful, rigorous and light, that drew King students, particularly those of the foundation year, to him over decades, constantly earning their admiration and indeed their love. Devotion is not too strong a word, I think. As it happens, I heard a wonderful anecdote, Tom, you're gonna kill me, <laughs> from a parent of one of Tom's former students just last evening at a dinner party, and I hope you'll indulge me. The parent knows I'm doing this. The student was in Tom's main tutorial some 25 years ago and worked part-time at the Dalhousie Library. That is a little detail that will become relevant to the story later on, so please hold on to it. A new FIP section began, and this entailed a new tutor, but the student refused to move and continued to attend Tom's, Tom's tutorial. <laughs> Angus Johnson, who was then director of the foundation year at the time, called the student in, admonished them for breaking the rules, and insisted that they begin attending the tutorial of their assigned tutor and not Dr. Currens. The student, frustrated by the decision, considered what kind of revenge would be most appropriate. So at their next library shift, they recalled all of the books Angus had on loan. <laughs> many dozens. <laughs> Tom might, as he makes quite clear in his blog, delight in the slippage between the authentic and the derivative, the original and the facsimile. Try, though he may, to persuade us that the facsimile has benefits and advantages beyond the original. We all know it to be the case that Dr. Curran is was, and always will be, an utter original. <laughs> As his retirement approaches, I am proud to call him my long-term colleague, my supporter, my co-conspirator, and indeed my friend. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Tom Curran to the <laughs> receive the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I hope there's a check as well. I've tried repeatedly to persuade my colleagues in the Foundation Year program to give a very brief introduction before a lecture, and then they can let her rip after the lectures are over, because the buildup is a little high here, yes? Uh, I appreciate, however, in particular, that Sarah has made it clear, I expect you to laugh. <laughs> so I'm kind of discombobulated now. My first joke, please note, in this very carefully prepared handout that there is a clock without hands. Since many of you may not have known the inside of correctional institutions, it's important to make clear that this is a prison tat, which is to say a clock without hands is a preferred tattoo because time is meaningless. I hope that you'll think that when you've heard more about Dr. Krauss and his concerns, there is a sense in which we move beyond time, even as he is no longer with us. And I was going to say, but 
I see that there isn't any room for anything else after that introduction. Everything seems insincere. Nonetheless, I was going to say, I understand that you're all here to honor Robert Krauss. And on that basis, I feel able to continue. However, I do also accept that there are people here who don't know or didn't know Robert Krauss or only have a sense of who he was. So I'll just say very few words about him, which is that he was a professor of classics here at Dalhousie. And in 1972, with other distinguished colleagues from Kings and Dalhousie, he was one of the founders of the Foundation Year Program, which is central to me and to my colleagues in as much as he also began the teaching in the Foundation Year Program in 72 with the medieval section and stamped his authority on that section, if I could put it this way, for all time, but sealed it completely with his lectures on the Divine Comedy, which uh, have instructed so many of us. And I better say also something I actually believe, which is that this is also a celebration of the Foundation Year program, which in my opinion has been of such benefit to so many of us, and then also benefiting those with whom we come into contact. Uh, so I'm going to cut out all the modesty parts at the beginning. It's no point, is there? Uh, um, <laughs> But uh, I would like to add that when this was first mooted, that it was a much more modest affair than it's become now, which is that uh, this is also, and really significantly, the chief reason that there is this book launch going on this weekend. Uh, three volumes are already in the offing. A fourth is coming. And I would like to thank those who produce these beautifully designed volumes, which are so much more appropriate in honoring Robert than anything I have to offer. Generally, Robert's travels were an opportunity to attend conferences and to use those opportunities to investigate libraries and manuscripts and become reacquainted with the architecture and art that he loved. And we benefited from those travels because then he would report back in lectures in the Foundation Year program here at King's what he had discovered about the architecture, particularly of Italy and France, and what was the Holy Roman Empire. And by this travel and report enriched our studies. Now, this is parenthetical, and I'm hoping, I understand this could be being broadcast somewhere, is that right? So this is a little out there. Let's just hope that uh, this has a limited viewership. <laughs> Robert reported that, of course, he was interested in traveling because he could then report back to us about things that we inquired about, but also what he had learned. But he informed me that while he enjoyed traveling, he was deeply afraid that he would be invited to join another tour of the world famous chateau, which decorate the Loire Valley. Uh, I believe it's a tremendous tourist opportunity in France, but he didn't want to go on another tour. So in his travels, of course, Robert had an opportunity to visit many historic dioceses and churches, but also some chaplaincies, even some English-speaking European chaplaincies. And at one of these places of Sunday morning worship, and I'm going to emphasize, not in Canada, Everybody heard me say that online as well, I hope. 
Uh, Robert had an opportunity to visit many historic dioceses and churches, not in Canada, and at one of these places of Sunday morning worship, Robert had a privilege that is only afforded to very few clerics and clerks and holy orders, if indeed any at all. What I'm going to describe is obviously a common experience for musical composers, whether in the liturgy or in the symphony hall. That is to say, the experience of hearing a choir master or a maestro provide an interpretation of a composition over which the composer has been toiling for months and even years. And I'd like to stress also, I heard the story from his own mouth, and therefore it is not apocryphal. So apparently, Robert informed us at a social occasion or over a cup of coffee, that he had indeed attended divine worship on a Sunday morning, not in Canada. And I had, I'm guessing, the almost unique pleasure, he had the almost unique pleasure of attending a live performance of one of his sermons, including all the themes and variations. And he identified it as a composition of his own as the reading began to hit its stride. I don't know, Bishop, whether you've ever attended an actual performance of one of your services, but uh, this was almost as if the composer was in the presence of a great performance. As I say, he began to recognize the themes and variations. Sadly, I forgot to ask Robert what opus number this might be, <laughs> and whether Robert felt that the work had stood the test of time. Also, whether he might be thinking of revising certain passages now in light of sitting in the congregation and hearing the recital. I should add that when divine worship was concluded, and this says everything about Robert's modesty and reserve, he shook the preacher's hand in brotherly greeting at the door and said simply, my name is Robert Krauss. <laughs> To which the cleric responded in the only sound possible, oh. <laughs> which he announced to Robert's retreating figure. I also forgot to ask Robert whether he ever returned to the same conventicle so that he could hear more live performances <laughs> of his other opera. Obviously, this is a late addition to my remarks but unavoidable in the academy-shattering acknowledgement of duplicative language of recent weeks. On the other hand, as I'm going to try and persuade you, Robert was a very differentiated person and had conflicting views which he could combine. And it is absolutely necessary in this context to mention Robert's profound engagement with and appreciation of both Igor Stravinsky and Thomas Stearns Eliot, who themselves happen to be friends. It seems that these two great titans of the first half of the 20th century were agreed on one principle absolutely. There are various instantiations of this governing principle, but my version reads as follows. A hack imitates but a genius steals. <laughs> well, I'm certainly a hack, but I intend neither imitation nor theft, which means that the project this evening has to be to provide snapshots into the Krauss legacy, which Sarah has conveniently described as an eccentric trawl through the medieval world. That's what you're going to get. A world that Robert, however, mastered and then passed on in his teaching, his publications, and his sermons. So I'm going to decline the Nobel Prize 
because now I'm going to explain the obvious contrast is with Robert Krauss's annual contributions to the meetings of the Atlantic Theological Conference, where Robert always provided the salient features from the medieval perspective, picking up from scriptural considerations and the insights of Christian origins, and then some aspects of the patristic world. Then Robert would come in before handing on the theological insights to the Reformation, the Enlightenment, and modernity. And I should say again, the genius here was to deliver a coherent account of key elements in the space of 40 to 50 minutes. Those of you who have had the privilege of hearing me even this morning in the chapel will know that you need to spend at least four weeks preparing a 12-minute sermon. I can only do 24. <laughs> should say again, the genius here was to deliver a coherent account of key elements in the space of 40 to 50 minutes almost impossible to conceive. And then to add to the awe of the occasion, Robert never talked down to his conference participants, but made all attending feel that he was not talking down to them, but simply reminding those, presence, those present of the things they already knew, which I can assure you was not the case. Now, the challenge will be to produce a coherent record of Robert's teaching by the zigzag approach, outed. But then I shall ask you to allow yourselves to be informed by the principle of St. Augustine's magisterial De Trinitate, his On the Trinity. And I had the privilege of studying this work with him directly. But in Augustine's On the Trinity, which is a definitive work, Augustine himself makes the disclaimer that, with respect to this, the greatest mystery of the Christian religion, there is no pretense here to give a final, complete, and exhaustive account of the nature of the Godhead. But rather, Augustine says, I write this in order to avoid saying nothing at all. Please receive my remarks in the same fashion. This is avoiding saying nothing at all. Every single attempt at a factual statement in what will follow in the next few minutes will be subject to the dissection of the most exacting strictures of academic scholarship. Each statement I'm going to make can be refined and redefined according to academic principles. And I have a slight aside here, I'm not bitter, please understand that, so I'm just <laughs> informing you of something. If one is reviewing the work of another scholar, there are three fundamental principles which provide the template for critical reviews. Number one, this is not the book that I, the critic, would have written. Or for that matter, the lecture that the critic would have delivered instead. Of course, the critic hasn't written the book. But that doesn't mean that criticism isn't required. Number two, why on earth did the author, the speaker, not discuss this absolutely crucial aspect in the questions of the topics under discussion? Well. The short answer is, I wanted to publish the book before it became a thousand pages. That would be one. Or I wanted to ensure that you would be able to leave the chapel for the reception before midnight. I think these are worthy goals. But they do open up for criticism because things are left out. And three, the most damning criticism, the author has completely misrepresented the import of both the facts and the interpretation of the material. I stand convicted even before I continue. OK, then. I am attempting to avoid saying nothing at all. So here goes. 
Obviously, if one was trying to say something coherent about the medieval universities in the European context, one is going to have to abandon 99% of the available material, perhaps even more. So I'm simply going to cite Hastings Rashtel, who at the end of the 19th century asserted that, quote, the first of the medieval universities was the University of Bologna, founded in 1088, although its official charter from Emperor Friedrich Barbarossa came much later in 1158. That is a statement of scholarship, and therefore you must accept it. Now, I'm in trouble immediately because, as you see from this handout, I've tried to protect myself by claiming that I'm only bringing to your attention the universities of the Holy Roman Empire. So I acknowledge my colleagues who have had brilliant careers at Oxford first and then Cambridge. And I mean no discourtesy, but I just don't know anything about them. And therefore, I'm going to keep my mouth shut. Not because they aren't important, but they are not anything that I can offer any insight into. And I need to find one of my pages, which I will do over here. And the idea originally was to I know already I'm going to be told off for moving away from the podium. I try to be good, but I have comic tendencies. <laughs> These universities here are just a selection. They represent nothing that one has to absorb or agree to in any way but simply to show that there was an immense amount of activity going on and that it was going on throughout what I call the Holy Roman Empire. I add, I have nothing to say about what was happening in Spain, Britain, and points further east, except I have mentioned the university in Prague. And every single date here could be disputed, but I have simply conformed to what the institutions say about their own foundation. So I'm not, let's put it this way, I wouldn't go into a LSAT with these dates as given. And then at the end there are a few references to universities which have, I think, formed much of our thinking about some of these questions. And another thing that I should say right at the beginning is that a studium generale, which apparently was the form under which many of these institutions began, I don't know enough about them either, and therefore I've simply put down when the charters of these universities apparently were delivered. There's an oddity here, which is that Pisa, which perhaps is not terribly distinguished before Galileo Galilei, precedes Florence. Not saying there wasn't anything happening in Florence, but again, I'm just following these charters. And let me get this out of the way right now. Pisa is here for only one reason, which is that it allows me to say something nasty about the situation in Italy. Two centuries after the death of Dante, not even two centuries, Machiavelli, whom we read with great interest in our course, went to try and settle things with Pisa, which was trying to separate itself from the, the, uh, the, the Duchy of Tuscany, and in Dante's Divine Comedy, many of you will have read the 33rd canto of the Inferno. 
with its horrific scenes. In Seamus Heaney's translation, a Nobel Prize winner, in Seamus Heaney's translation, four words are produced. Your atrocity is Theban. So it's reference to Thebes, to patricide, fratricide, incest, and horror. Please forgive me for that diversion, but that's the only reason it's there. The University of Paris, and uh, we have friends who would know this more directly, uh, seems to have been active from 1150. Perhaps there was a more formal form of education from 1170, but the rich, written statues are first in 1210. And it has to be central for our considerations because of the use and Notice that's taken of the University of Paris in Dante's Divine Comedy, Cantos 10 to 14 of the Paradiso. I think possibly at least three or four, maybe six of my colleagues have lectured on these same cantos, but everybody has been informed in the first instance by Robert's groundbreaking critique, commentary, and presentation of the cantos. So, without involving you too deeply in Dante's formulas, it should be said that the heaven of the sun, the sun following Aristotelian principles being stable, the earth is stable, the sun revolves around the earth, which is based on common sense, not on modern science. The fourth heaven after the moon, Mercury, and Venus is the sun, and it is the heaven of the doctors. Why this is so important, and I could ask some of my colleagues to stand up now and give a much better explanation. Why this is so important is that the uh, two circles of doctors that you encounter in the heaven of the sun. One is led by St. Bonaventure, a Franciscan, and the other is led by St. Thomas Aquinas, a Dominican. And in this perfect sense of reciprocity and exchange, which is taken from Aristotle and which is descriptive of Dante's approach in paradise, there is perfect reciprocity and exchange, form under which city life occurs by the fact that Bonaventure praises Dominic, the founder of the other mendicant order, and Thomas Aquinas praises Francis, the founder of the Franciscan order. So there's this overlap, exchange, and balance. And I haven't put all the names here, but the point of this is to say that the first circle that is introduced by Thomas Aquinas involves going counterclockwise. I spent 10 minutes trying to figure this out. It is counterclockwise, isn't it? Yes, it is. He goes counterclockwise and introduces uh, his great teacher, Albertus Magnus, who uh, certainly uh, he encountered in Cologne, which did not then have a university, but a studium generale, but he may also have encountered him in Paris. And the idea is that as you proceed from Thomas Aquinas' right hand in a counterclockwise direction, you have a list of those who influenced Thomas Aquinas most profoundly, and 
perhaps then more remotely as you make your way past 11, 10, 9, so on and so forth. Notice Dion Solomon is there, Peter Lombard, who was the great teacher and provided the textbook for a lot of medieval theology, King Solomon, Dionysius the Areopagite. But the crucial point is that the last figure that he introduces he begins on his right hand with Albertus Magnus's teacher, and he ends with his most significant academic, scholarly, and heretical opponent, either Siege of Brabant or she's Siege also, sometimes he's called, who taught in the Faculty of Arts at Paris and essentially undermined everything that one had tried to establish about what is called the medieval synthesis in which theology and philosophy and the arts all provide an edifice which is, shall we say, coherent. CJ, it says, I've just dropped something out of one of these uh, handbooks because I can't do any better. CJ produced a extreme form of a independent view of how philosophy teaches us the nature of the human. Very much in opposition to St. Thomas Aquinas. I've put on your sheets, among the 219 Heterodox theses condemned in 1277 by the Bishop of Paris were definitely things that CJ had been teaching and writing, but also includes anonymously propositions that probably represented Thomas's own teaching. So he was in very good company. But the issue was, and Dr. Krauss has explained this, and my colleagues, I'm looking at some of them now, have furthered my understanding of this. The issue was that the character of the human, our capacity for universal statements and rational thought are divine, and therefore that is the portion of the human that can survive death, the divine spark, the ability to see things in a universal way. And for both Thomas and then Dante, this is a disastrous position because it means that the character of the sensitive soul, which is the basis of amor and love and our human affections, will disappear. And this is in the poetry represented as his fight with his great friend Cavalcante, who feels that since the human in its universal moment will be restored in its divine aspect, the rest falls away, and love is tragic. I don't wish to prejudice your reading of the Divine Comedy, but its purpose is a reunion with Beatrice, who is an actual person who had a body, who has a resurrected body, probably, but whose personality will survive into the afterlife. What's extraordinary about this though. Remember, Dante is not himself required to put all his cards on the table. When one thinks of Dante, there are three great teachers that are present everywhere in the work. Aristotle, Virgil, and Thomas Aquinas. But in the character of the disputation of the universities at that time. Dante here allows that in the final analysis, at the end, Thomas Aquinas and CJ can be next to one another. As close on the left hand as his teacher is on the right, reconciled there in a way that will never be possible here. The St. Bonaventure circle, which I haven't produced for you, is 
very similar in the sense that as we make our way counterclockwise, we come to on the left hand of the great mystic Franciscan, his greatest thorn in the entirety of his generalship of the Franciscan order, Joachim of Fiori, who believed that in the year 1300 there would be a millennial or an apocalyptic moment. They were not able to see eye to eye here, but they will be there. Now, I'm very conscious that people here actually know stuff about the Reformation. So I'm going to say a few unguarded things, and perhaps you can report me. And then if you'd send me a private email showing how insanely wrong this is, I would appreciate that. I understand that the best way is to put it on a listserv, but uh, I can make a request. Calvin, the great, just is Bruce Gordon here. Uh, Calvin is reputed to have said that in scriptural interpretation, what you needed to do was to push the argument to its most extreme form so that you could actually establish what the position meant and became. And when you had pushed it to its extreme form, then you would wait for God to settle it in the next life. So you didn't have to agree with anyone here because you were simply representing the position in its most complete fashion. For the rest, God will work it out. Now the reason there's this passion here is that, as you see, Wittenberg is also mentioned, unfortunately. Uh, it is a medieval foundation if you uh, allow that uh, the end of the 15th century is in fact still part of the medieval world. It predates Machiavelli's The Prince, 1513, and also the 95 Theses. And I was going to put Wittenberg in the list in any case, whatever happened, because I simply have to point out that Wittenberg is the home of Dr. Faustus, and we have taken Faustus's serious teaching seriously because uh, here we have suggested that global ambition will meet infinite, help me, infinite, it's in, I, thank you. Infinite ambition. I mean, that is actually what Dr. Faustus, the play, is about. So that is the first thing I want to say about Wittenberg. But the other thing is that uh, the single most important play, a very important play in the English language, is a Shakespeare's Hamlet. And as you know, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern were fellow students with Hamlet in Wittenberg. And I'm glad to see you've come back after the Christmas vacation because the tragedy ensued by the fact that his mother, Gertrude, begged Hamlet not to go back to the University of Wittenberg. And you know the tragedy that followed. But the real reason is that, and I thank the students in FYP for pointing this out. Martin Luther actually taught Aristotle's ethics before he became a doctor and a professor at the University of Wittenberg, but he instructed students in the text of Aristotle's ethics. And I put, simply put as an aside, that without Aristotle's ethics, it would be impossible to understand Dante's Divine Comedy. So he actually taught Aristotle's ethics. And because of the needs of the Reformation spirit, it turns out that Aristotle, I'm kind of dizzy now, 
is a minion of Satan. And deceived and duped people into thinking that there is a kind of ethical world apart from one's devotion to God. Robert Krauss could handle this. He would point out that this is a question of priorities. Meanwhile, some of us are left here trying to sort of solve some of these problems. The one that particularly flummoxed me was, consider the lilies of the field. They sow not, neither do they spin. Well, I have life insurance. I've got insurance on the house. And I'm not keeping in tune with the priority of the kingdom of heaven and its needs. So, I'm very happy to hear that my salvation has nothing to do with anything that I get up to, good or bad. It's entirely in God's hands. And I feel overwhelmed with gratitude, as is required by Luther, discovering that I am absolutely incapable of doing anything of virtuous nature. It's a great relief. <laughs> it truly is a great relief. And I am you know, thrilled to discover that I am a worm and no man. Or as I prefer to put it, a boiling bag of pus. However, when I leave here this evening, I need to stress this. What's happening right at the moment is tragedy. But by tomorrow this time, it'll be comedy. Because the definition of comedy is tragedy plus time. But at the moment, it's tragic. And I have to get through the rest of this day. And I'd like to say Aristotle has helped me. Do I have to consign him to the jaws of Satan because he has provided some practical advice on how to get through the day? In Vienna, the Karlskirche, which is a massive Baroque structure, was going, undergoing huge renovations. And therefore, they built a actually built an elevator in the middle of the transept, which would take you right up to the uh, decorated ceiling, so you could look at it very carefully, and then go up into the, into the structure above of the dome. And it was you know, awesome to be able to see in a corner of this massive decoration, Martin Luther being cast down to the devil in the corner. I mean, it's great. But I don't want Aristotle to end up with him, if I can put it that way. <laughs> now, I have to expose myself more than I'd like. And therefore, uh, Ingolstadt, which is also a medieval foundation, is only there because that is where Dr. Frankenstein developed the technology by which he was able to create a person out of human bits, but as I shall be arguing, a person with a personality who deserved better. Of course, that's in 1818, not at this point, but it's also of interest that in Frankenstein, the novel, Albertus Magnus also gets his look in. Königsberg is there because that's where Immanuel Kant spent his life teaching. And again, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by colleagues who know all about this stuff. So please understand, I'm only mentioning these names in order to say nothing. Four zero. Thank you. Uh, I've abandoned my notes, as you see, because I could see this was not going to go anywhere. So. I'm going to move to a rather more important moment from my point of view, which is that Napoleon abolished the Holy Roman Empire in the year 1806, which is a dramatic and profound moment in the history of Europe. 
and most of the intellectuals who lived in the German speaking, there's no Germany, there's the Holy Roman Empire, most of the intellectuals who lived in the German speaking parts of Europe, which were still under the order of the Holy Roman Empire, which I know you know this, Voltaire said, wasn't holy, wasn't Roman, wasn't an empire, but otherwise extremely well named. Uh, but the German speaking world saw in Napoleon's determination to bring order and reason to Europe an opportunity for freedom. Everybody knows the story of Beethoven and the Eroica Symphony. They were ser seriously disappointed. I mean, just speaking of the Holy Roman Empire, the capital was Aachen. When Napoleon got there, he removed every pillar in the chapel so that the structure was no longer stable. And uh, the Germans are not getting the pillars back. I can tell you that, too. Uh, but what's important to me and to us, I think, is that the Prussians, who had a military tradition, which they were very, very proud and needed, because any time there was a conflict in Europe, troops were marching back and forth through their territory. So this was a form of protecting themselves against the French, against the Russians, to some extent against the Bohemian world, but also the Swedes. They were defeated twice, basically on the same day overnight in two battles, one at Jena and the other at Auerstedt. And the result of that was the Peace of Tilsit between Napoleon and Prussia, which was a formal humiliation of a formerly very proud nation. Should add that basically the University of Vienna was closed after the day after the battle. Napoleon rode into Jena and was spied by the impecunious philosopher named Hegel from his garret window and under the most extreme circumstances completed the final pages of a massive work called The Phenomenology of Spirit. And uh, I can put a plug in for Neil now, uh, who's teaching a course which would give you all the background you needed. But uh, the um, point of this is that the manuscript was produced under extreme pressure, and he tended all his life to revise the final chapters because they were done in such a haste. There being no secretaries and his having no money, there was a single manuscript which he sent through enemy lines to his publisher and bum bag. It's unbelievable. And for three weeks, he had no idea whether the manuscript had survived. It's possibly his most important and famous work. So Prussia is without the dignity that it had always felt crushed by Napoleon in military terms. And I'm not exaggerating. This minute actually exists. There is a minute where the king and cabinet determines that what Prussia has lost as a military power, it will regain by intellectual means. And the establishment of a university in Berlin, Berlin, the capital of Prussia, which up to that point had only had an academy of sciences, which was established in 1700 by the philosopher Leibniz. We're racing to the end. And the principle upon which this university was going to be based, it was going to make a statement which would cover the humiliation of the military loss, was that it was going to be a speculative university in the sense that all of the sciences, which in German are Wissenschaften, so that could include the arts and the natural sciences, would be taught. And it was expected that students would have some relation to every aspect of knowledge. Kurt Vonnegut, if you've heard of him, one of his novels says that it's 
thought that Aristotle was the last person on earth who had a complete grasp of the culture in which he lived. But there was an attempt, and their documents exist, the founding of documents exist, and you can consult them, to create a university which would be opposed to compartmentalization and would require a complete grasp of the nature of our knowledge of things. Obviously, this is not going to work in terms of the history of science and technology. Hegel was aware that the natural sciences had to appear in this unity, and I actually tried to give lectures on it, more or less successful. But I would like to point out, I'm not talking about the history of science and technology here in as much as in the foundation year program's treatment of the Enlightenment, the main actors are not in universities. I'm sure that's not true in the natural sciences. So they're already can sense a set of a split there. Now I have to find my note. Which is hopeless. So let me continue this way. You have seen the film Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer? Oppenheimer. And the key conflict in the film, which, by the way, is very close to the book upon which the film is based, American Prometheus, the key conflict is compartmentalization. General Groves is determined that compartmentalization is absolutely necessary for the protection of the security of the secret work they're doing. And Oppenheimer, in the film, based on the book, opposes compartmentalization because he says that unless every person involved in the project has a sense of the entirety of the project, we can never bring this to a satisfactory completion. He even points out that some departments which have been siloed don't know that other problems have already been solved so they could move ahead because there was attempt to keep everyone siloed. And I'm afraid that the curriculum that we now prefer is one in which the silo effect of our ability to talk to one another will be undermined and supported. So uh, the uh, attempt on the part of the University of Berlin, it was explicit, was to create an environment in which everyone could have a sense of the whole, whatever their particular concerns. And this is developed at the University of Berlin in something called the hermeneutical circle, very highfalutin language for uh, art of interpretation. That's all hermeneutics is. Sometimes claims that hermeneutics is based on the figure of Hermes, Mercury, the messenger of the gods, because it was based on biblical interpretation. And Schleiermacher, who taught at the University of Berlin, was accused of being critically deficient in his treatment of the Bible. He defended himself by saying, since I regard the scriptures, the foundation documents of my entire teaching and pastorship, I actually need to know what the scriptures say. I think that's a very profound defense of himself. But the idea is, in order to read something like the Divine Comedy, you have to have a sense of what it's about as a whole. Without that, you have no idea of how to slot the particular issues in the work into your interpretation. On the other hand, as you work, as I hope in FYP, not on the entire 100 cantos, but perhaps on one in an essay, you have a sense of the particular now, which will inform your more complete understanding of the whole back and forth, I would like to commend this to you. So, the final thing I have to say is that, I think I've mentioned the name of Hegel, have I? Don't normally do that. Sometimes we refer to a, a significant philosopher of the 19th century. What I'd like to point out to you 
from memory. Is that, I have to find this, sorry. Let me flip through these pages for a moment. I'd like to assure you it's here. Well, I'll never find it. So uh, on that basis, uh, you can trust my memory, which is, you know, fantastic. I take power drinks every day. Uh, in 1841, on the 31st of October, the rector of the University of Tübingen, which plays a large part in the development of German idealism, gave an address to the university to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the accession of William I to the kingship of Württemberg. So I'd just like to stop here for one second. Very, very brief. A, Prussia decided that what it had lost as a military power, it was going to recover as an intellectual power. Just think about that in terms of our political environment. Second point, at the celebration of the accession of the 25th anniversary of uh, Wilhelm I, William I of Württemberg, the rector of the university gave an address in which he argued, I was gonna read out the German, it is here, in which he argued that the philosophy that had developed in and around Berlin beginning in Königsberg with Kant, but being developed more fully, as Neil has told us recently, Fichte, Schelling, and Hegel, that this philosophy was not an accidental product of a particular group of individuals who happened to be living in the German-speaking world at the same time. Uh, probably, you know, Kierkegaard's criticism of this, who also studied in Berlin, by the way, which is that, uh, Hegel spent too much time smoking his pipe and therefore it confused his brain and his cranium came to think that there were universal thoughts which one could hold. So I, I give the opposite side very fairly here, yes. But the rector of the University of Tübingen argued that the philosophy which developed in the 1820s with, of course, a history but which was developed and lectured on in the 1820s in Berlin was not a product of accidental conversations had by individuals like-minded, but was actually an aspiration of the human spirit which had to appear. That is to say, these thoughts had to emerge. Where they emerged was accidental, but that they actually had to come to consciousness. And once we've had them, we can never forget them. My final words are relative to a text we read and which is very abused for the simple reason that it's, even the title is not properly translated. It's called in our text, Hegel's Lectures on the Philosophy of History. First problem is that it's only the introduction and in order to see if this has any sense, you have to see it applied to history, to see if it has any actual purchase. But the key point is, it has to be understood as he did, the philosophy of world history. So that immediately protects him from arguments that this is not history, but it's fantasy, speculation, and uh, essentially incomprehensible general principles. But on page 22 of our translation, Hegel is quoted correctly as saying that the philosophy of world history is the progress in the consciousness of freedom. And if that simple statement could be retained, a lot of the issues with the work become, you can disagree with him, of course, 
but you don't have to disagree with what he didn't say or think. His world history is a consciousness of freedom, and I believe F.C. Bauer, the rector, is right in saying what we think of as freedom relative to the state is an idea that had to emerge and which we try in the foundation year program to bring to your consciousness as a historical development which had to appear. Amen. It's past time. Are we allowed to go yeah. next door? Yes. Yes, I'd like that very much. <laughs> this, uh, uh, this session is, is to be followed by a reception in the President's Lodge, which is right next door. Go out the door and turn right. You will soon find your way uh, there. And uh, I hope you're able to stay and look forward to uh, seeing you there. I believe that Dr. Curran will be there. So you can have Adam uh, <laughs> if you uh, are able to, to get to him. Thank you. <laughs>